I have three different considerations or three different points that I want to make. One is the power of darkness. The second is the power of illumination. And the third is the gospel being the catalyst of that illumination. The, both the, the power of darkness and the power of light seems to both be hidden today. People don't realize what a stronghold darkness and deception really is. And people don't realize how powerful illumination is. Every, the, the devil has reduced everything down to the tangible. If it's not tangible, then it's like written off. It's just ignored. Now, not, not every country is like this, but our, our uh, supposed great country is. It's been, been, uh, been reduced down to, the, uh, to the, the tangible. Now, we have many uh, examples in the Scripture. The Lord is, is so merciful, has been so merciful to us in the record of Scripture. He has given us examples of, of any and every uh, experience, valid experience that you can have in, in life, in, uh, in redemption, in the good fight of faith, in, uh, in running the race that's set before you. There's, there's examples of it in Scripture. And so you, all, you can always have confirmation. No matter where you're at on the road that leads to life, you can find brethren that have been there before you. And this is, this is very needful for you to know. This is one of the ministries three times in the book of Acts the, uh, it says that the disciple they went and they confirmed the souls of the disciples. And this is an aspect of confirmation is while you're running this road that leads to life, you see other people that are running right next to you, and it conf it's confirming to you. And so here, here's some examples of uh, these are testimonies of warnings. Demas forsook Paul having loved this present world. And Demas stands as a testimony of warning to us, a testimony of the power of darkness. He was with the apostles, not only the, uh, the apostles of the Lord, but the chief apostle, Paul. Who else, what, what better exposure could he have had, more potent uh, influence could he have but to be with the apostle Paul he labored more abundantly than they all. And what it, it's not that Paul failed Demas. It's that the power of darkness overtook Demas. So he stands as a, as a warning, a testimony of warning. The rich young ruler, he had a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus and went away sad. You've heard people lament of the uh, wanting, wishing that they... Could have seen Jesus, could have heard him teach, could have seen the miracles. This man did. Yeah. And he left being sad. Right. It didn't mean Jesus failed. Mm -hmm. no. It didn't, didn't mean that his arms were tied. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean that he, uh, he just threw the towel in. It, that's testimony to the, the powers of darkness. Mm -hmm. This rich young ruler couldn't see what Jesus had offered him because of what was already in his hands. It was, that's evidence of the power of darkness. When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he says, you are carnal. Doesn't get any more plain than that. Yeah. <laughs> this is the doctor's diagnosis. You are carnal. Yeah. Yeah. You, you fuss about this and you argue about that. One says this and another says that. You come together and it's pandemonium. Yeah. The assembly is just chaos. Because you come for different reasons. Some of you are rich. Some of you are starving. And the rich don't care about the starving. Some say I'm of Paul. Some say I'm of, of, uh, of Cephas. Some say I'm of Christ. What's going on in Corinth? You are carnal. Uh -huh. it was, they hadn't completely shaken free from the influence of darkness. Yeah. That's what had happened. Alexander the coppersmith. He had a chance to hear Paul preach. And instead... He did him much evil. Alexander the coppersmith, be, beware of him, Paul said. The powers of darkness. He, Paul, or Alexander felt his industry being threatened. And he was, he was, in the, he was clutched by the powers of darkness. And he, so he fought against Paul rather than believing the message that Paul uh, gave. The church at Laodicea, you remember what they said about themselves. They didn't, 
We don't have any record of what they said about Jesus. We do have a record about what they said about themselves. Mm -hmm. We are increased with goods, and we have need of nothing. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were completely wrong. That's right. mm -hmm. That was darkness. That was, they were speaking from the perspective of darkness. We have need of nothing. When in fact, from the, in the light, they were poor and wretched, wretched and blind and miserable. They were completely wrong in their assessment of themselves. And that's because they were in the, pow the power of darkness had, com had deceived them about their own condition. Of course, Judas stands at the, at the lead of all these examples of warnings in that he, he valued the 30 pieces of silver above Jesus himself Amen. and made a covenant with the, with the Jews to uh, betray him. You might ask yourself, how could a person ever, ha having been with Jesus for this long, how could a person ever stoop or return or become, how, how can a person be capable of doing such a thing? Well, the answer to that is the power of darkness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He exchanged Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Well, Jesus said, if your eye be evil, how your whole body is full of darkness and how great is that darkness. Mm -hmm. The darkness is so great that Judas willingly handed over Jesus. The darkness is so great that Demas just, he valued the world greater than, than the kingdom to which he had been exposed. How great is that darkness? The fact is the deceiver depends on darkness. The success of the devil depends on the power of darkness. His dark, or ignorance is his ally. The, the devil does his work in the dark to deceive and to lead astray, and to blind, it's in the darkness. Blindness is his aim. Darkness is his, uh, is his uh, kingdom, and ignorance is his ally. So, see, darkness is not static or passive. It's not that someone just made the wrong decision and ended up being in the dark. It's that darkness is actually, is actually aggressive, there is power and personalities associated with darkness. It's not, well, let's just say it this way, Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The danger of darkness is that there are rulers who wield darkness like a sword. It's a weapon against us. Their per, the the uh, pervasive influence in, of darkness is seen in the aggression against Judas, against Demas, against Laodicea. We, we, see, we can see and behold the aggressive, pervasive nature of darkness in that darkness is not, it, darkness is, is not intimidated or fearful to even go after one of Jesus' 12. It's not... Uh, it, it has no compunctions about attacking one that is with Paul. That's the na this is the nature of darkness. Colossians 1.13 says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Deception can, can gain a, a hold on people or on a region or on a generation or on a nation. There's power to darkness. There are personalities behind darkness, dark influence, um, deceiving influences, the, the influences of the, of the devil himself. There is a power of darkness, Amen. which means that no one just walks out of darkness of their own accord because they're, they're, we had to be delivered from it. Darkness has, has power over people. It's like make subjects and vassals out of people. We had to be delivered from the power of darkness. The power of darkness was first seen in the garden. At the first suggestion, this is like, like the, the power, the darkness was, was just creeping in, like just edging, uh, edging its way in, crawling in to influence the, uh, the creation of, of, of God the Father. Hath not God said... And the power of darkness took down, brought the whole race down. From the, at its first confrontation, 
the power of darkness overtook the, uh, the, the sons, the creation of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whom the God of this world, having blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of God, glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So blind, there's a personality behind blindness. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which, of them which believe not. He, people are, there are people held captive by him at his will. 2 Timothy 2.26 says that they are held captive by him. Light, one of, man, one of man's greatest needs is light. It's illumination. The, ba- the, the general approach at, uh, of remedy towards that, that is taken towards man's problem is almost always changing their behavior the psychological approach is develop, developing new new habits the the medical approach is uh changing your activities in your diet the i mean it, go, it goes on and on and on it's never it, it's always an, a, an approach from the outside when man's greatest need is to be illuminated Amen. when man when a man is illuminated then the power of darkness is actually threatened. Satan, act, Satan, light is actually renders Satan impotent. He's the ruler of the darkness. But where there's light, Satan's devices don't work. They only work in the dark. Jesus has brought the enemies devices into the light he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel so satan he's actually been robbed of his stealth okay he can now there, there's there's a technicality in here the the uh the scripture says that uh, jesus has destroyed the works of the devil and that's very that's a very technical statement he didn't say he's destroyed the devil he's bruised his head but he hasn't yet been put away and there's, there's a technicality that's important to see. He's destroyed the works of the devil by bringing life and immortality to light through the gospel. He hasn't been put away. But when light shines unto you, then the devil's devices don't work. That's how his works have been destroyed. He's brought life and immortality. So he, he's actually exposed his tactics. There's, um, of course, great value in conflict to being able... Uh, to be, be able to work in stealth, to be able to move, uh, to move around and to communicate undetected. And that's how Satan works. But in the light, then his, he's, his cover's blown. The gospel blows his cover and he loses his stealth because life, light and immortality have been brought to light through the gospel. Now just consider by way of, of uh, contrast the power of illumination. The Lord has also given us uh, examples of what illumination does, the power of illumination, and can, the moral impact of, of illumination, of what, what happens when a, a person is illuminated. What fruit is, what fruit is grown by illumination? Well, the prodigal son is, is one example of that. He came to himself. That's another way of saying that life was brought to light for that prodigal son. He came to himself and he realized what what foolishness he had willingly um, partook of. He came to himself and went back to his father. Life was brought to light in that what he was giving himself to was vain. What he was giving himself to couldn't even sustain him. Life was brought to light. He came to himself. When, see, he was, he was impacted by illumination. When he, when he could see things, then, he, then, his, then he, he did differently. Zacchaeus, when the Lord came to his house, he said, I, I restore fourfold. Mm-hmm. Now, just imagine, I mean, you, you know how, how effective the five-step plan or the two-step plan is. 
for somebody to give this to Zacchaeus. This is, this is what you need to do in order to be successful to give fourfold back. If, if Zacchaeus wouldn't, he wouldn't do it until he was illuminated. But illumination changed everything. Amen. In the book of Acts, it says that Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened, her heart was open to attend unto the things of the Lord. It was opened by, by light. Life and immortality was brought to light through the gospel. And, and she attended unto the things of the Lord. You remember Asaph writing about the, his uh, confessing about his confusion. Sister Tasha mentioned this. And he saw how he is, he's troubled while he's trying to serve the Lord. And the people who don't give any, um, any allegiance to the Lord at all, they just, they just float right along and they don't, have any, they don't have any trouble and they're blessed and they flourish while he, he's, uh, things are against him. It says until, that was, that's darkness. As it was, he saw things like this, that was darkness. But when he entered into the temple, into the sanctuary, and light, uh, life was illuminated, then he, he saw what was really going on. Life and immortality was brought to light. They loved not their lives unto the death. How are you, how are you going to force somebody to do this? There is, there is no um, impact like the impact of illumination. When life and immortality are brought to light, then it so in dramatically impacts people that they love not their lives unto the death. Life is, people hold on to life until the very, they'll hold on to life more than they'll hold on to anything. The struggle to, for, for life is the most vicious struggle to hold on to life. But when, when immortality is brought to light, then people, then suddenly it, it makes, a, it makes a, a people that are not afraid to die. It makes a people that are, that are willing to give up their lives, to lay down their lives, to, not re, to even refuse their deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Amen. This, this looks so strange in a moral arena. Yeah. In a mortal arena, it looks, it looks like th this is the, it looks like utter foolishness for a person to be willing to die because death appears to be the end. It appears to be the end of all, but when <laughs> immortality is brought to light, they love not their lives unto the death. That's testimony of the power of, of illumination. Paul and Silas, they were exemplary that night that they were uh, chained in, in uh, prison. And at midnight, they uh, were praying and singing praises unto God. There didn't appear to be any reason to do that. According to experience or according to um, the basics of life there wasn't any reason to sing praises unto god but life had been enlightened for paul and silas paul and silas knew that this was this this may turn out somehow for their good this may end just at any time and it did like when life was brought to light then the experiences of life don't dominate you when life is brought to light then you don't become a servant or a vassal of experience. When life is brought to light, then you will not fear what man shall do unto you. Amen. Life was brought to light and immortality, yeah. then they weren't, they had no fear of death. Right. And of course that resulted in, it says there in Acts chapter 16, I think it is, is that, and the prisoners heard them. That's, right. That's probably, they, probably the best sound they'd ever heard in that prison. Certainly different than, uh, than the sounds they probably were used to with new prisoners coming in. And certainly that jailer, the, the Philippian jailer, had never, never heard this before. And, he, and it resulted in, in his conversion. Amen. And Paul says in Romans chapter 2, it says, But to those who seek for glory, honor, and immortality, to them shall be given life. Amen. To them who seek for glory, honor, and immortality. See, it's been... 
bringing life and immortality to light, it means he's made it available yeah. Yeah. for men to obtain. Amen. They, they, uh, men can obtain that world. They can obtain the resurrection of the dead. So to those who seek for glory, honor, and immortality. See, no one seeks for something that they're ignorant of. The, the knowledge of, of uh, the, the knowledge of it is what uh, feeds the pursuit of it. He's brought life and immortality to light. Now men are seeking for immortality. There really wasn't much uh, said in the, the, from uh, Adam until the days of Jesus. There really wasn't set, much said about immortality. Some of the prophets, you know, the uh, Jeremiah and, and Isaiah, there'd be a little hint about the resurrection of the dead. Job even said just a little bit. He, he, could, he didn't go on and on and on about it, but there was some indication that Job could, he, uh, he concluded there about the, the tree that was cut down, but it would, then it would sprout up again. He made some conclusions about this, but there wasn't just volumes of information about immortality. David said the most about it, of course, in the Psalms, that forevermore, things, things like this. But you couldn't just go to every neighbor in those days and find out about immortality because it hadn't been brought to light. Yeah. But now that it has, it, Jesus, uh, people were asking Jesus, what must I do to obtain yeah. everlasting life? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever asked David that question. Yeah. Nobody ever asked Moses that question about eternal life. But now, it, now that it's been brought to light, it's made known. Amen. And now, Amen. now people are seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. The impact of illumination is a rational impact. Yeah. When, peop- when a person is illuminated, it's not that, they just, that things, things are just going to be okay now. You ever heard people approach life at that? Like that, I trust God, and so I just know that things are going to be okay. Well, that's a good starting point. Yeah. But that's not how Paul, that's not how Paul rendered his, uh, it's not how he reasoned about being a prisoner and knowing that his head was probably going to be taken off. He didn't just say to those at Rome, it, it's okay, everything's going to turn out. Yeah. Immortality had been brought to light. He could see what God was doing. As a prisoner, Paul traveled more than he ever could have. Not be it, the. It was the government that foot foot the bill for all of Paul's travels. See, light was, uh, life was brought to light for Paul, and so he'd make the most of every opportunity. And he, how else could he have affected the whole palace guard? He preached to prisoners. He preached to servants. He preached to, and the whole palace heard heard about this prisoner. That's what he said to the Philippians. The impact of illumination is is rational. So see. Uh, illumination actually makes it makes the redeemed man it makes redeemed people sober in their in their good fight of faith it makes them sober in in running running the race so it's not running as just running aimlessly it's not boxing as it, as just beating the air in life and immortality being brought to light it means you run you run in in a straight line not not it makes your, makes your efforts very ineffective when you just run, run this way and run that way. And you're fighting. You can make it when, because life has been brought to light, you can make every blow in your fighting make it worth the effort. Yeah, yeah. You can make it effective. Mm-hmm. And so it makes it in a, an intelligent, intelligent race and in an intelligent fight. Illumination is effective in rescuing men from sin. It's, it's remedial. Illumination is effective in redemption. I think that's what lar- something that has largely been, been, been lost. Salvation is effective largely through illumination. Illuminated men are saved, and saved men are illuminated. He's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Anything that's directly connected to the gospel is a foundational element. Illumination is, is formidable protection mm-hmm. in the good fight of faith. Uh-huh. Satan's options, so to speak, are dramatically reduced when a man is illuminated. Mm-hmm. When life and immortality are brought to light, then Satan, the, 
Satan's tactics have been severely handicapped mm -hmm. because illumination is, is a formidable protection against the power of darkness. Now, it's been, it's been brought to light through the gospel. Life and immortality is brought to light through the gospel, not just through a... See, the, bo both the preaching and the gospel have, they both had their meanings changed. Uh -huh. yeah. Preaching has been changed to mean, largely, I tell you what to do. They say things like, pre preach at them. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't need preaching, he needs loved. Uh -huh. Whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> and the gospel also has been, the meaning of the gospel has been changed to just, Jesus died for your sins. Well, that certainly that's part of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 summarizes the gospel, but it is a summary. The gospel, as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. That's the summary of the gospel. But that's not the whole of the gospel. Here's another part of the gospel. You've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the living and abiding word of God. That's gospel. Put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Isn't that the gospel? Yeah. That's yeah. good news. That is, that's the gospel. Life and immortality have been brought to light through the gospel. So if the gospel's not being preached, life will be dark. That's right. Amen. If the gospel's not preached, immortality will be, people will be ignorant of immortality. <clears throat> there's, there's an inseparability between the gospel and preaching. The gospel can't be seen. I know that there, there are evidences. There are evidences that can be viewed. I, I understand that. But I don't, I don't know that people really understand what they're saying when they say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one, because I can't see somehow that Jesus, that God through the faith of Christ is imputing his righteousness. I can't see that. It has to be declared. 1 Peter 1.25 says, This word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Preaching and the gospel can't be separated. The gospel has to be preached. A gospel that's not preached is a powerless gospel. It has to be preached. Men have to hear. Faith does come by hearing, not seeing. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says that he, he called you by our gospel. They were called by what they heard. They were called, they were drawn to God by what they heard from Paul. Paul, God called the Thessalonians through what Paul said. The gospel sounded good to them. People <clears throat> followed Jesus because of his teaching. But because of what he said, 1 Thessalonians 2.9 says, we, we preached unto you the gospel of God. The gospel and preaching can't be, can't be separated. Jesus said in Luke 22, to the poor, the gospel is preached. It's made known. It's declared. It's made known. To the Romans, he said, I am ready to preach the gospel unto you that are at Rome also. And this was a church. See, there, there's another departure that we hear often is that the, uh, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't preach to, to uh, the church. We shouldn't preach the gospel to the church. The gospel is for sinners. Except you're saved by the preaching of the gospel. Right. We're saved by the foolishness of preaching. Mm -hmm. And of course, you understand the juxtaposition there is that the foolishness, it's not foolishness to us. It sounds foolish to those that are out. Mm -hmm. But to us, it's the power of God. The same preaching. Mm -hmm. It's not foolishness to us. To us, it is the power of God. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to preach the gospel. Paul said, I'm ready to preach to the church that's at Rome. Yeah. And I... I'm convinced there are people today that would, if they had a chance, they'd tell Paul he was wrong for wanting to preach the gospel to them that are at Rome. And he said later in uh, Romans, I have fully preached the gospel to you at, that are at Rome. He preached the gospel to those who have already believed. In fact, the deep things of the, in the scriptures, like to the Romans and to the um, uh, to the Hebrews, the, the weightier matters of Scripture, they're written to people who believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, Paul said to the Corinthians, 
uh, Je Jesus didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. Well, and by the way, that's what convinces people to be baptized, is the preaching of the gospel. Paul wasn't refusing to baptize people, saying that's not why he was sent. He was sent. Somebody else did the baptizing. That's what you conclude. Paul did the preaching. Somebody else did the baptizing. Amen. The preaching is the catalyst for illumination. When God, from Brother Ricky's text, when God shines into your heart, he does it through preaching. What really have you ever seen someone do and it illuminated something about the gospel? I, I can't think of anything. But when somebody preaches the gospel, then I can see more. It opens up. Life and immortality is brought to light through the gospel, Amen. through the preaching of the gospel. So that's why Paul said, that uh, to the Corinthians, <clears throat> I declare unto you that gospel which I first received, then I declare it unto you. 1 Corinthians 15. It says, that which I received from Christ, that declare I unto you. That was the, the preaching of the gospel. And so the, the, uh, I, I commend to you a consideration of this is, the, this is God's design, is through the preaching of the gospel, men are illuminated, and then just look at people like Paul, like Saul turning to Paul, and like Lydia attending to the things of the Lord, and like the disciples rejoicing that they were considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. These are all evidences of illumination. The Lord has given us these portraits of illuminated people. This is how illuminated people respond when they go to jail. This is how illuminated people respond when they're in a shipwreck. This is how illuminated people respond when they're threatened. This is, how, this is what illuminated people do. This is an illuminated person. And boy, I, I marvel at the power of illumination. Amen. They love not their lives unto the death. Yeah. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. I say, give, evermore, give us this illumination. Amen. 